Hello, everyone. My name is Sherry Nick Nickerson, and I'm a director here at Old Line Government Affairs. We welcome you to another edition of Online with Old Line. Uh, for this edition, we're really excited to introduce Senator Corey McRae, representing District 45 in Baltimore City. Senator McRae, thanks so much for being here with us today. Sherry, right, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so I'm going to give a little bit of background to start out. Senator McRae was first elected to the House of Delegates in 2015 and then to the Senate in 2019. And from what I understand, you also come from a political family. You've got a sister who's in the Baltimore City Council as well. So um, it sounds like it runs in the blood. Um, you currently serve on the as the majority whip and sit on the Budget and Tax Committee in the Senate. So let's go ahead and get this rolling. Senator McRae, uh, to get this rolling, can you just tell me a little bit about your, yourself and the district that you represent? Uh, perfect. So I'm born and raised in the city of Baltimore. I live in the Overly community. I live there with my wife, Demetria. Um, I live there with my four kids, Kennedy, Reagan, CJ, and Bryson. Um, I'm an electrician by trade out of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Small business owner, been buying houses up and down Bel Air Road since I was 20 years of age. I got my training wheels in the house, as you stated, in 2015. Uh, worked on things such as voting rights, uh, worked on things such as expanding apprenticeship opportunities for our young men, our young women in the city of Baltimore and in the state of Maryland, um, and just transparency around government. Uh, 2018 took a large leap of faith and ran for the Maryland State Senate. And as you stated, uh, 2019, being able to serve in the uh, Maryland State Senate and one of the greatest opportunities and honor just to be in that space. That's great. So what are the demographics of your of your district? So for those folks just thinking about the 45th Legislative District, I represent East and Northeast Baltimore City. Um, the northernmost part of my district is Northern Parkway. The southern part of Mount Vernon Station North and Hopkins. Uh, the western part of my district is Harford Road and the eastern part of my district is Pulaski Highway. Uh, when we think about um, uh, the 45th district or just the city of Baltimore as itself, you have a number of uh, challenges that we had. So predominantly probably in East Baltimore, when you're thinking about uh, violent crime, when you're thinking about abandoned houses, when you're thinking about concentration of poverty, when you're thinking about um, our young people that way to navigate that's what you think about from that specific piece but then also when you move up the Hoff Road and Bel Air Road corridors um, you also have uh, um, very diverse wealth um, diverse in ethnicity um, uh, and you just have a great amount of opportunity and one of the greatest goals that I can imagine the 45th district is just making sure that we have an equitable stance in reference to, in reference to those communities had then uh, not had the investment that's necessary in order for them to thrive. And that's what I wake up each and every day, try my best to make sure that we can correct um, and making sure that we direct resources in those places because I believe that every neighborhood should be successful. Absolutely, and it does sound like a pretty diverse, diverse district that you represent. So um, you've been a member of the Maryland General Assembly now for six years. Um, what originally inspired you to run for uh, I tell folks that I'm not uh, as political as a number of my colleagues are. Um, I say sometimes I tell folks, especially when I'm talking to young people, I say that women are smarter than men. I'll start with Demetria. So me and Demetria have known each other since we were 17 years of age. As soon as she turned 18, she went out here and she participated in a democracy and she started to vote. And my attitude towards voting was they leave me alone, I leave them alone. So like most young people, you just don't think here for you you just think like hey they're, they're a hassle they're in your business and you just kind of want to move as far away from them as possible i think that as i grew up older i wanted to say maybe about 26 27 uh you'll see that then i started to participate in voting if you looked in the van file uh you would see that i wasn't a regular voter we call them super voters but but eventually one of the things that you realize is that politics surrounds everything that we do in life whether what our schools look like, K through 12, what our streets look like, whether our utility lights out in front of our home come back on in two days or two weeks. It depends on the level of government, especially on a local level. And when I think about that, I think about all the neighborhoods that I grew up in, all the neighborhoods that I rode the bus through, where I went to high school in, and, and you know, my friends currently live at this moment and say that we could do better. 
Uh, so I feel like I was very blessed, blessed with a good career, blessed with a family, blessed with investment. But the reality is, is that life is not about how well you do, but how many people can you get across the finish line uh, with you? And that was one of the reasons why I uh, got into um, uh, politics because I tried my best to get behind good candidates. I couldn't see them cut through, but I knew that I had the discipline to go out there and knock doors, talk to, it's not my generation that's voting. It's usually the parents or the grandparents that's voting, but help them to realize that I am their son. I am their grandson. I am what they wanted in their child and that I'm a son of Baltimore and just want to help represent and lift the city of Baltimore. Um, and just been doing that every day that I've been in there, them six years, them seven sessions and trying to make sure that they, they are proud in the vote that they cast it. That's fantastic. It sounds like you're very passionate about the city of Baltimore and, and representing your constituents. So, so nice to see that. Um, so before, did you have any expectations when you ran, um, are, are things any different in Annapolis than, than you imagined that they would be when you first ran for office or? Yeah, you know, when I first ran for office, because uh, you, I always say it's two types of elected officials, and sometimes there are three, very rare that there are three. You have campaigners and you have policy wonks. Uh, many of the ones that I serve are policy wonks. And then that third option is where you can get both of them in one category, but that's very, very rare where you can find those two unique skills um, inside of an elected official. Um, the, the thing that I think about, and, and I would tell folks, this is the people's legislature. So keep in mind that Corey McRae didn't work for a senator or a delegate prior to serving in office. Uh, uh, didn't know much about Annapolis. I've been to like rallies. I've been outside of the building, but I'd never been inside of the building to be sitting at the table in the capacity that, that I was in. I do know that I had common sense. I know that I have a quick ability to be able to adapt and learn the spaces that I'm in. And I think that in the city of Baltimore, one of the things, especially if our young people can keep out of trouble, you learn how to hustle. And I think that going into Annapolis and figuring out how to adapt in that environment was uh, different, but quickly uh, uh, a quick opportunity for me. Um, so I don't say that I knew what I was in store for, um, but I did try my best to become a quick learner. Um, I think that when you talk about quick learning, some of the things that I learned probably in the first two years, uh, uh, one of the most important things in a general assembly is the Department of Legislative Services. And that could be made up of a lot. Uh, I, I've sat down and built personal relationships, not just with my colleagues, but the staff uh, that work inside of those uh, institutions. M make those relationships with the bill drafters, make those relationships with the fiscal analyst folks, make those relationships with the library. So I didn't really know how to draft a bill, write a bill. I knew that conceptually, I knew what I thought would be helpful for my neighborhood. But then I got to meet those people that are very uniquely talented at these types of things. This is their craft and figuring that piece out. Um, I've, I've got to meet people like Annette in the library. So I knew that I didn't have to do the research. You have folks that will do the research. If I wanted to know how many blue sweaters were sold in the state of Maryland from the year 2010 to 2015, our library, the LDLS would try to figure that out for me. Um, so knowing how to get to those pieces. And once you've figured out how to draft a bill, research a bill, the thing is now, how do you get that bill passed? One of the things that I, I uh, learned was in reference to uh, making sure that I get an attorney general's opinion, especially on my most controversial bills, but even on some of my smaller bills to make sure that it's not preempted by federal law or things of that nature. I learned those lessons um, early. Being able to work the chairman or work the respective committees that it's actually going through, how to then build relationships uh, with the folks that are on those committees. And then some of the most important people are the committee staff. Because those committee staff are helping to explain your bill, to, the, to my colleagues and things of that nature, being able to learn that process, but not only learn it, but actually build the personal relationships that was necessary in order to do, do those types of things. Those are some of the lessons that I learned. So, so Sherry, the question that you asked was like, was this expected when I went into the legislature? I did not know what to expect. I knew that I had to work hard. I knew that I had to do, do things. And, and, and for freshmen that are coming into the legislature, I tell you, 
my first several years, and I still do this, but not at the capacity that I did it the first several years was, I consistently met with folks for breakfast, especially early on because we're not as busy. So every day I was meeting with lobbyists, good or bad, colleagues, good or bad, staff, good or bad, and with lunch. But more importantly, in breakfast, uh, breakfast time was one of the predominant uh, paths because I knew I had, you usually don't get to control your schedule in the legislature. In the beginning, you do get a lot of control in the, in the mornings. Sounds like you're a true student of the legislative system. And that's really cool to hear that you've done that because I'm not sure a lot of people take the time to really understand. You know, a lot of people, I, I just want to know what time it is. I don't want to know how the watch runs. And mm -hmm. sounds like you really made an effort to find out how does the watch run. Yep. So that's pretty cool to hear that. Um, what would you say in your six, seven years in the legislature so far has been your, your most uh, your biggest accomplishment, the thing that you're most proud of? So I have a, a number of pieces that, and, and when I think about it, uh, when I think of a piece of legislation, whether it's sponsoring and co-sponsoring, if you see Corey McRae's name on something, you know that it was very intentional. I do not sponsor uh, everything. I do not co-sponsor um, everything. So when I think about the things that I'm most proud of, Shari, my first year, and this is funny, because I didn't get one bill passed. And, and one of the things that my colleagues said, Corey, while you didn't get one bill passed, no freshman can say that they got a gubernatorial veto. So my first bill that I got uh, vetoed, and then it did pass the next following year, we overrode the veto, was restoring voting rights to uh, uh, 40,000 people that are on parole or probation. So 2015, it seems like it's a big deal. Like this is, this is a, a very critical issue, but across the country now, we're talking about voting rights and how do you expand these things. Shari, when I made that case, I would let folks know that these are the same people that live right next door to us. They right. pay taxes, whether you're talking about sales taxes, uh, uh, income taxes, things of that nature. Their kids catch the bus like our kids do, but why do they not have the basic right to vote? It seems like a crazy wild idea in 2015, but when you look at Virginia, Kentucky, everybody's moving um, in this direction uh, from there. But this was 40,000 Marylanders. Shari, why are things like this important? So when you look at two zip codes in the city of Baltimore, Let's take 21210. This is the northern part of Baltimore City. This is like Guilford, Rolling, Rolling Park, and things of that nature. There were uh, 10 people, 10 people in the entire zip code that were on parole or probation. And this is because the wealth is different. The cost of homes is different. It's a more affluent right. zip code. But when you looked at a zip code that I represented, 21213, that same year, 937 people. So when you look at the disparity, 10 people in the zip code versus 937 people in the zip code. Elected officials say they pay attention to everybody, but that is not true. They pay attention to people that vote and they pay attention to neighborhoods that vote. So the neighborhoods that faithfully these older African-American women go to the polls every time, every they're indirectly impacted by such a large concentration of people that couldn't vote that was right next door to them. That's probably one of the, the, the greatest opportunities, but it was so many things from the minimum wage. I heard the president talk about it. I, I was able to lead that effort uh, in the Maryland State Senate my freshman year. Um, and just this year, doubling down on infrastructure and transportation, I think that this is another issue that the uh, Biden administration, the Harris administration is gonna be working on, but making sure that over a six year period, $2 billion are invested in our light rail our MTA, our MARC train, our subway. But while, while these aren't the sexiest things because you, can, you can't see when you're maintenance, maintaining and maintenance in it, these are very important needs of uh, the city of Baltimore, the state of Maryland, regionally, just for us to thrive and for our public transportation system to thrive. I, I could go on and on and on, but I'm gonna stop right there with those three. So it sounds like you've accomplished a, a whole lot in your career um, and and you know in such a short amount of time that's that's pretty amazing um, so you've talked you've talked about what you have accomplished what do you still have out there that you're that you're really passionate that you want to that you want to accomplish in the in the coming years um, you know it's, it's it's still very early. Uh, one of the things that I would say, Sherry, is uh, this year right here was probably my best year yet. Um, this year, uh, you know, I sit on budget and tax uh, mm -hmm. because of the uh, forward uh, forward 
succession to President Bill Ferguson, it then gave me opportunity. I'm a subcommittee chair on public safety, transportation and environment. Sitting on that budget committee, being able to build the relationships in the Senate, we were able to get 21 bills across the finish line in both chambers, which is wow. crazy. That's impressive. Like, like I, I, I just was in awe. If I could think of things that I would like to work on just in the future, I'm going to speak very broad. Uh, I'm a workforce person because I went through a five-year apprenticeship program. Workforce opportunities are very, very important to me. I tell folks that that's what changed the trajectory of my life, but it also saved the life of Corey McRae. I think of, so, so I think about how do you expand that for young men, young women that may not look at college or university as their first uh, uh, option, but there are still successful people that are electricians, plumbers, carpenters, and things of that nature. And we need to make sure that we're lifting that up and not always putting that down um, uh, from that standpoint, because nobody's going to come in my house and do electric work, let me be very clear. The second piece of it is, as I've been in the General Assembly, I've realized how important this education component is. So when you think about K through 12 education, if our young people are failing by the third grade, we can already see that we're building a prison system, a jail cell form or things of that nature because they're not gonna be able to catch up uh, from that standpoint. So we as Marylanders, we as leaders have to be making sure that we make the investment that they need in our young people because they didn't choose to be here but they can okay. choose the right path for our future. And then I also think about from a small business uh, aspect, I know that it's very tough um, uh, out there. I've been able to see it firsthand. I always say that 2011 was the most challenging year that I've ever had and never want to put myself in that situation. But people, businesses, families are making very tough choices each and every day. And we need to make sure that competition is a very good thing. We need to make sure that everything isn't about always about the big, big, big corporation, but how do our mom and pop stores, how do our local jurisdictions thrive? Because they're the ones that are fueling our economy. Wow, so so you've got a lot you wanna accomplish while you're, At sounds least, like you're uh, gonna be around for a while. That's great to hear, but but it's so nice to hear that you're so, about your your constituents and your, you grew up here and you want you want to make Baltimore City and your your district uh, a better place and a more profitable for everybody that lives here and it's it's so nice to see your passion and you're still really passionate about it. Um, so to wrap things up, can you give us one unique or fun fact about yourself that you'd like to share with everybody? Uh, one unique uh, fun fact. I'm a very avid reader. I love reading about uh, leadership, history, wealth. Um, I uh, don't really know how to play sports very well. I wasn't always good. I got picked because I had friends, but I wasn't always the first person picked on the team. Maybe the fifth, but not the first. Um, uh, I, I love my family. Um, my daughter is going to poly. My 13 year old is going to poly, but it's an exceptional program. Uh, with uh, ingenuity and just, you know, glad to be in this space at this moment. And I never even could have imagined that I would be in this, uh, in, in this body at this time. Well, that's, it's quite an, you've, you've accomplished a lot. So, and, and I know you're an avid reader because we had a conversation the very first time I ever met you. You gave me a long list of books about Maryland politics that I need to read. And, and just so you know, I've started recently plowing through those. Okay. A little bit at a time. I just got time right after session. So, so I appreciate you sending those to me. And thank you, Senator McRae, for taking the time to join us today. I know that you have a lot on your plate right now. And we look forward to having more opportunities to work with you in the future. Um, and then for the rest of you who are joining us for more conversations with legislators and more online with Old Line, please visit oldlinelobbying.com.